It is that time of year again, time to recognize the very best of the very worst. My esteemed selections for losers, not of the week, but of the entire 2023 year. Now, there were many, and I mean many options to choose from this year, because while the supply chain may still well be broken, there are two things we are not in short supply of, losers and illegal immigrants. So let's start with pick number three, Bidenomics. So if you'll recall, the White House, or more accurately, Biden aides, who I assume are millennial or Gen Z gender studies majors, thought it would be cute to wrap up his economic failures into a bundle and put a bow on it titled Bidenomics. And for a couple of months, it was all the rage. In fact, White House Press Secretary Corrine John Binder even called it the word of the year here at the White House. Okay. Thanks, Corrine. I wanted to ask you about this uh, new Bidenomics messaging push. Can you just give me a sense first of, you know, how did you guys coin that phrase, or why did you decide to go with that branding going forward? You don't like Bidenomics? No, I'm just asking. I'm I curious. I think it's pretty clever. It's pretty good. Um, look, um, it makes good sense, Bidenomics, right? It kind of flows off the tongue really well. He's going to go to Milwaukee. He's going to talk about Bidenomics, investing in America, what, he, what Bidenomics has done. Not a whole lot trickled down on my dad's kitchen table in the top-down economy. But when you mill from the middle, when you increase the middle class, the poor have a shot and the wealthy still do very well. The middle class does well and we all do well. That's what we call Bidenomics. That's what we call Bidenomics. Well, then something happened. Americans started to call BS and realize this Bidenomics thing wasn't actually doing too hot. In fact, poll after poll after poll shows us that more than half of voters say they're actually worse off under Biden and Bidenomics. But instead of acknowledging that, the Democrats did three very predictable things. Insisted things were better than people who were living through them actually realized. Asserted this slow period was because of COVID. And their favorite, well, they blamed Donald Trump. But even that didn't work. So as of this month, the White House, eager to keep people from associating the current and dismal state of the economy with the 80-something-year-old vegetable they're trying to reelect, well, the left has ditched the term. So Bidenomics, like its namesake Joe Biden, is a major loser this year. Rest in peace. Next on my naughty list this year, actually, this transcends the world of politics and is hopefully something we can all agree on. Loser two this year, people who threw things at musicians and entertainers. It is not acceptable to throw things on stage, whether it be a friendship bracelet or a drink or a cell phone. Just don't do it. It's not funny. It's not cute. It's not content. It's stupid and it's dangerous. And if you do it, you should be arrested and charged with assault. And now, for the moment you've been waiting for, the number one loser of the entire 2023 calendar year, roll it. This month, I celebrated my day 365 of womanhood, and Bud Light sent me possibly the best gift ever, a can with my face on it. Check out my Instagram story to see how you can enjoy March Madness with Bud Light and maybe win some money, too. Love ya! Cheers! <laughs> there it was, folks, the ad that took down an entire beer empire. Bud Light is undoubtedly the biggest loser of 2023, so much so that the term Bud Lighted has now become a verb. That transgression not only tanked sales for the company, but kicked Bud Light off the top spot of America's number one beer. The Mulvaney partnership, the brand's response or lack thereof, all lessons in truly a real-life masterclass on how not to market anything ever. The American people have spoken. We are sick of woke. We are sick of DEI scores. We are sick of the Rainbow Mafia bullying us all into submission. That Bud Light Mulvaney partnership was more than an ad campaign. It was a line in the sand. And for once, conservatives and normal people, well, we stood our ground. So let us carry that energy into 2024, because if we can send a message to a beer brand, we sure as heck should be able to send a message to Washington, D.C. Those are my losers of the year from Nashville. God bless. Happy New Year and take care. I can only imagine. Now, this is just like 
me coming up with my preconceived notion because you've grown up like in the sports world and you're surrounded. I mean, it is, it is a male dominated industry going from this male dominated industry to a female dominated area. You probably came in like one of the boys, like ready to just like, you know, bowl everybody over. And I, I don't know who was guiding you the whole way, but they're probably like, okay, Gracie, like <laughs> these poor little girls, you're, you're too strong and dominant for them. <laughs> I was definitely the sporty one, definitely the one with a roommate and I was awake so early and she's like, why are you getting up to work out? I just want to sleep in. Um, but I think that that's good. Having different strengths and weaknesses, meeting people who are more girly than you, the hair, the makeup, all the lights, cameras might be deceiving, but I am a tomboy through and through. Yes. Once I finished pageants, I actually went back to my sporty roots and uh, pursued marathons for a stint before you know, getting a little hurt and having to re uh, rehab from that injury. But that process taught me a lot as well. Yeah. Marathons are no joke. I've only, I've only run a half marathon. I don't even think I have it in me to run a full marathon. Uh, so I always respect it. I believe in you. You could totally do it. So I ended up running my first full marathon because after you stop competing in pageants or stop competing in whatever industry you are in, you need something else to set as a goal to satisfy that adrenaline um, kick that you're used to. And so one day I came across a sign with my mother on a trail and it was for the Aspen Valley Marathon. And my mom was like, oh my gosh, a marathon tomorrow morning. You should absolutely run what? it. So at this point, just to give you a little background, I was not a runner in college or high school. I just did it to stay in shape for soccer to give me endurance. I was running about eight miles a week, once a week. And honestly, I'm just going to say the grace of God and the strength of God pushed me through this because I was like, you know what? That sounds like a great idea. So you know what I did? I signed up for that marathon 13 hours before it started. And I wasn't going to tell my dad because he is somebody who you really, he believes in training properly for everything you do to ensure the best outcome. Of course, it's only logical that you would do that. Um, but sometimes I can be a little spontaneous and I ran this marathon. I finished in three hours and 45 minutes and lived to tell the tale. So that was the beginning oh my gosh, of my that passion is, for running. I see. I thought my story of signing up a month in advance of the half marathon was something to brag about, but you have me beat one mile or 26 miles or however long in advance you sign up, it qualifies you to brag about your running journey because we're all runners and it's it's a gift. But I just have to ask, uh, you know, I know there was probably a lot of conversations behind closed doors, but I, I just want to know, you know, have you felt support from your colleagues, especially women? Uh, because I remember during Women's History Month back in March of this year, there was a special, an ESPN special that came out showcasing, you know, Women's History Month. Um, and the special was surrounding Leah Thomas uh, and how brave he is and how how inspiring he is and how much adversity he had to overcome and persecution to, to uh, achieve the seemingly impossible by winning a national title. Um, and I remember watching this and hearing the voiceover, of course, noticing it was a woman who did the voiceover and I just remember thinking to myself, you know, I could not imagine being a woman working there, being asked to report on this issue with a smile on my face yeah. and doing it. Uh, and so I just kind of wanted to ask about the support you felt from women uh, since, of course, taking the stance that you have. None. <laughs> None, which is not shocking. However, um, I'll start with the positive, which is Samantha Ponder. And I know that you got to meet Sam Thanks. and she's been a dear friend of mine for about 15 years. Um, uh, and her, her maiden name is steel. So Sam steel, Sage steel. We're, we're, we're like, we're twins. We're related. Um, and she, and I talked after I had begun to speak up, which was right, right after your tweet, I think. Um, and, and she, we talked and she's like, Sage, I, I want to speak up so badly too. What do I do? And first of all, Sam is one of the smartest, um, most wise women I've ever been around in my life. And um, she knew what she needed to do. And, and she did it in her time. And I think over the summer decided to speak up as well, but it's literally just been um, Sam and me and that's it. I'll say that, you know, obviously I was still at ESPN in March 
And I remember coming to work a day or two after all of those aired um, and, and the Leah Thomas one aired in particular. And I was on the set sitting next to the woman who voiced it over. And I just remember wanting to ask her like, really, you have daughters. What do you really believe this? Um, I didn't because it's not worth it at some point, right? People are gonna do what they're gonna do. I do know that, um, you know, we were all, all the women on sports center were asked to voice over uh, several of those little clips. And I did two or three of the female athletes and they were great. I was not asked to do the Leah Thomas one, but probably strategically, they know what I would have said. <laughs> um, and the thing is, is I'd been asking for months to talk about this story on our show. We had two hours live every day and we never, ever, ever did it. And that was disappointing because we do a lot of things incredibly well, especially on the show I was on. We were, we were awesome. Um, but I, 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 when I saw it air, I was just heartbroken, especially as someone, I mean, for the last, for, from 2010 through 2021, I was um, kind of the face of ESPNW, our, our women's summit, and it was women in sport. And it was all about uplifting women and making sure that we are seen and heard and represented in our highlights on SportsCenter. Um, salaries and all the stuff that we've talked about with the women's soccer team, like so many things. And and as kind of the face of it, I, I was all about women, women, women as one with daughters, all of the above. And I thought, what, what are we doing? Then I had more and more conversations um, with some people who were in the boardrooms meeting, talking about this before they all, all those montages, all of them aired. And a couple of people were like, and these are men in the room who are saying, what are we doing? There are so many other women to choose from and we're choosing a man. We're choosing Leah Thomas. Why, why go there? Why do this? And so there were people in those meetings that I know who spoke up, who were ignored. So it was strategic. Um, they saved it him. I'm with you. I say him, not her, uh, for the last one, I think too. Right. I think that was the last one to air. Um, Grand finale. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was beautiful. Um, that disgusted me. I'll also say this. I mean, I was, um, I was asked to stop tweeting about it. I was asked to stop um, doing anything, saying anything about it on social media because I was um, offending others at the company. I made sure I sent off another tweet that night after I received that email. Tim, you're old school. I'm putting the ball in the tee for you here. How much has the transfer portal removed the shine or the luster from the other bowl games? A lot. It's a shame because if, again, you go back to what the bowl games always represented and what they represented was an opportunity for a lot of young guys that might be playing their final games in college football, as that old ad advertisement used to say, most of these guys will never play football again. And when you see kids like the, the ones last night from Texas State, you know, winning that game against Rice and going nuts, you know, um, uh, playing at SMU's uh, new stadium there on the campus at Southern Methodist. It, those moments are magical. They mean a great deal. Uh, but how many people really care when given the circumstances that they, they don't even know who was playing or why this or that player didn't play? And even at that level, a lot of guys aren't there. You know, again, what the NCAA did to Malik Murphy, by example, uh, the Texas quarterback, because of the portal being where it is, he had to make a decision and vacate the premises for Texas. And that could become a factor if Ewers were to get hurt. Sure. He took a lot more snaps for Texas after Ewers got hurt in that game that Spencer and I had against Houston earlier in the year. Uh, and Arch Manning is now the next guy in line. What a storyline. But Murphy had, Murphy had to make a choice. And there are other players in other bowl games that were in similar positions. Poor Florida State has been crucified by that. Uh, and certainly George has lost some players too, but you know, for those arguing that, well, we'll find out, you know, just how, how, how much damage was done to Florida state when they play Georgia, you know, this is a redemption opportunity The hell hell with redemption. It's not redemption. It's a glorified exhibition. And everybody in America knows that with the players opting out because they're protecting their futures. This is happening throughout the bowl system who created those dates for the portal decisions to be made. The NCAA, do you think they give a rat's ass about those kids and college football in general? Absolutely not. Further proof why the first and foremost move 
by the governors of college football, the commissioners, starting with Petiti and Sankey and Yormark and everyone else in the offseason is to get the NCAA's hands off. I mean, completely off college football. Run the men's tournament, run the women's tournament, run the uh, lower divisions and the non-revenue producing championships through the money made off of the men's NCAA championship and get the hell off our lawn in college football. There's a lot of news of uh, frustration, uh, financial um, kind of disparity to trying to figure out a decision of how to go about easing the pain for Russell and the organization and the GM and Sean Payton. Uh, But all in all, this has kind of been handled unprofessionally. Uh, And I say that from playing the position myself of you have a starting quarterback who's the leader of your team and a captain. Um, in the last few weeks, things have kind of spiraled in the wrong direction. And I say that because, you know, we go from the argument on the sideline to uh, not apologizing to what we, Russell and I talk about is between Russell and I to the team not looking the same, uh, nail-biting games, uh, but also some games where they just kind of look poor. And, um, you know, was it what we've seen in the beginning of the season now to where we are now? And then we're here now where they're benching Russell uh, and going with a quarterback that has been to two other locations and it hasn't fared well for him, but he gives you the best chance of winning. That seems to be the cliche that all coaches use when they want to bring in another guy uh, and bench their starting quarterback. Uh, gives us the best chance of winning. Really? Is that how you feel? Armando, all in all, uh, with decisions that's been made uh, from your standpoint, being uh, a, re- a big time reporter, what kind of questions would you ask Sean at this particular point? Yeah, no, that's a good, that's a good point, but I have to, I have a joke and I have to put it in here. <laughs> it's, it's very rocky in Denver right now. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> gotta do that uh it was it's an alley-oop um so and first of all at his press conference yesterday sean payton made it seem like he's doing this he is benching russell wilson because Russell Wilson hasn't been playing well and the team needs to use his quote, his words, a spark. He tried to make this seem like this is like any other quarterback benching for a a non-producing player. He went on to say that you can't bench the offensive line. You can't bring in five new receivers And so you have to change the quarterback. And that's where if I were in that press conference, I would pull out my red flag and a a yellow flag, whatever, some flag, Cuban flag, any flag, American flag, um, and go, no, that's BS. Because it is BS. We're all adults in the room. We know what you're doing. Right. We know what the history is and we know that you're lying to us now because it has nothing to do with uh, lack of production. This is a, a team that gave up 70 points, 70 points to the Miami Dolphins and did, did Vance Joseph lose his job? Did they say, Vance, you need to do better? Did did any defensive coach lose his job? Um, did any defensive player lose his job, get benched? No. So Russell Wilson, who has had his ups and downs this season, right. is, is losing his job because you're not winning? Because you didn't score on that goal line situation and you decided you didn't call timeout. You didn't ask for a replay. Uh, The running back and the offensive line got no push into the end zone. And Russell is the guy that's getting yelled at. Um, Look, the bottom line is Sean Payton and Russell Wilson. That was a weird marriage to begin with. 
Yeah. <clears throat> and and it's clear that Russell Wilson is not Sean Payton's cup of tea. He's not his guy. He's not his quarterback. Um, he he's he's more than happy to go in a different direction, even right. which is mind blowing. Even if that direction, forget about Jared Stidham, yeah, who yeah. is starting this week. Even if that direction is uncertainty, he right. prefers uncertainty uh, in the coming years to the certainty of Russell Wilson, which is mind blowing to me because you might do worse than Russell Wilson. And it suggests that there has to be something underneath there that is not football that just Sean Payton despises about Russell Wilson to the point where he'd rather have uncertainty than what 24, 26 touchdown passes this year, uh, a 98 quarterback rating. He'd rather have uncertainty than that. Well, you know what the funny thing about it, you you mentioned it. It's something under the layers and under the layers, it means, his his paycheck, uh, the type of person that Russell is. Remember the comments that were made that I want Russell to stop kissing babies and taking pictures, and 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 kind of get get into what we're doing. Which Russell every Tuesday goes to the children's hospital to spend time with some of the the kids who are battling um, illnesses, um, have been in the hospital for a while, uh, and so on. So. For him to make that comment about Russell and everything that that he does off the field, um, and you haven't really coached Russell, you know Russell, because Russell was a big fan of Drew Brees. Uh, He was a big fan of Sean Payton. Uh, At one point when he was in Seattle, he he put up a list of teams that he wouldn't mind playing for, and New Orleans was one of them, uh, because he loved the way that Sean and Drew kind of managed the game. Uh, And so when this marriage came about, Everyone thought, looked at it as if, oh, well, it's either not going to work or he's going to kind of rejuvenate his career where it'll be more of what we've seen from Drew Brees. And to be honest with you, it was more of what we've seen from Drew Brees in the late last four years of his career. Now, Drew's shoulder wasn't health, fully healthy and he didn't have the power uh, that he must have that he once had once the shoulder injury healed and. For a couple of years, we kept putting up numbers. There were a lot of passes, 15 to 12 and under. And that's what we've seen after the loss, I think, to the Miami. Because remember, they went through it with Buffalo and the Jets. They, they struggled with those particular teams. And then all of a sudden, they get hot. And so when we hear of comments of back in October, they came to Russell about possibly taking a pay cut. And Russell said no, which... As a former player in this game, no, I'm not taking no pay cuts. It's the contract that I signed, you signed. And why would I take a pay cut? Because I take a pay cut, I'm not going to get that money back because you're going to try to figure out a way to either trade me or get rid of it. 